Welcome everybody to the 2020 Woman Pharmacist Day panel discussion. I am very, very excited to be here with true leaders in pharmacy and they are all women. Um, this panel discussion and webinar has been on my mind for a few years and as you know, Women Pharmacist Day started in 2018 and really the thought behind it was when I was working at the University of Illinois, there were a lot of photos, black and white photos of women um, in pharmacy in all the graduating classes. And back years ago, there were sometimes only three women per class or four women per class. And as I would walk through, they have every graduating year on the, on the wall. I got to see that there were more and more women. And I, as I'd walk into my office, I'd often look at the years, you know, 1930 and, uh, and see 1950 and see that there were only like four or five women. I always wondered, how did those women feel? You know, what were they thinking? What was going through their minds? What was going through their families' minds? Were people disappointed in them because they went to school maybe instead of getting married right away or starting their family early on? And how difficult was it for them? Um, you know, did they experience anything while they were in school? And so that was really um, when I was thinking about Women Pharmacists Day um, and the importance of it was really the impetus behind it was seeing all those photos of, of those women. Um, so today I'm really happy to bring uh, some true leaders in pharmacy together to talk about women in pharmacy and a, a lot of different topics. And um, today we have Dr. Brooke Griffin, Dr. Kate Gaynor, Dr. Linda McLean, and Dr. Alex Brodus. Um, and I'll have each of you kind of just introduce yourselves to everyone. Brooke, do you want to get started? Sure. I'm really excited to be here today and very thankful for all the trailblazers that went before us, for sure. My name is Brooke Griffin. I'm a professor and vice chair of clinical services at Midwestern University College of Pharmacy. And I'm also the founder and creator of 21stCenturyPharmD.com, which focuses on personal and professional development for pharmacists and pharmacy students. Thank you. Kate? Thanks, Susie. Glad to be here today. Also, my name is Kate Gaynor. I'm currently the CEO of the Iowa Pharmacy Association. Um, I'm the first woman to have that title. Um, the Iowa Pharmacy Association has been around since 1880, and I'm the seventh executive vice president and CEO and first female. I'm excited to be here today and thanks for the opportunity. Great, thank you. Linda? Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here as well. Um, as I think about what my career has looked at, like, I've intersected with, with many of you out there as well as Kate along the way. So, Linda Geralds McLean, my passion is community pharmacy. I owned community part pharmacies with a business partner for many years and since then had the opportunity to go into academia. So I serve as the vice dean for the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Washington State University. Now, Kate, in the association world, I was the second uh, female president for the Washington State Pharmacists Association. So uh, have been around lots of um, really in, influential and visionary uh, women throughout my career at, that has helped to shape uh, my career tra trajectory. So thanks for having me be here as well. Thank you, thanks so much. And Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Burtis. I'm the Senior Director of Specialty Health Solutions here at Walgreens. Um, previously, I worked primarily on chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma, and I'm actually moving into the specialty space now. I am blessed to work with a lot of incredible female leaders here at Walgreens, and they've been very supportive of me in my career. As a working mom, I've got a four-year-old daughter. So always try to be a good role model for the rest of our working mothers out there in carrying forward our own professional um, goals as well as the goals for our profession of pharmacy while making sure we show up at our other jobs, uh, taking care of our spouses, partners, family members, or our children. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thanks for being here. Um, so I really wanted to talk about the changing demographics and kind of just address what's been happening. And through a lot of the research that I've done, um, you know, I found that I was actually really shocked the first time I saw that women have graduated as the majority for the past 40 years. So for four decades, 
women have been the majority of the pharmacy graduates, but that you know, a lot of numbers in terms of leadership have been lagging and they weren't kind of equal in terms of the majority of, you know, CEO deans stayed the same, um, you know, despite, I want to say when I started pharmacy school back in the year 2000, there were 82 colleges of pharmacy and there were about 15 female deans. There were, um, now there's 143 colleges of pharmacy and their um, number of deans is only 25. So looking in, you know, in terms of academia, there really hasn't been an increase in women CEO deans. So in top level positions, um, thinking about ownership, you know, um, Linda, as you're talking about ownership, it's been the same. So there's been about 25% of women owners for the past 10 years that hasn't increased at all. So still they're predominantly uh, male owners in, in pharmacy. So let's talk a little bit more about you know, the changing demographics and pharmacy and what's kind of happened, um, you know, that, that you've seen so in your career as well. Well, you know, I might jump in here uh, to start off the conversation. I know that some of the information that you found said that in the 60s, there were about 15% uh, pharmacy school graduates were female. I graduated in 1978, the number was 20%. So it was still uh, relatively small and um, graduated at a time when, kind of like now, uh, the, the positions in pharmacy were harder to find. Uh, we said, oh, there's, there are plenty of pharmacists, and so the demand wasn't there for, for some of the individuals. My dean, Dean White, uh, sent a couple of us to Spokane to interview for a position. Um, my buddy and I um, headed to Spokane and, and both interviewed for the same position with Mr. Jones. Ed Jones owned Jones Low Price Pharmacy. And after the conversation, you know, I didn't, I feel like our graduates today know a lot more about what they're going to be getting into, what to ask for, how to negotiate. And I went on that interview and had a great conversation with this individual. I had done my homework, so I knew that Mr. Jones was a past Washington State Pharmacists Association uh, president. I knew that he was on the board of pharmacy. I knew that he had a national position with paid RX. And I knew he was really, really active on a national level with both APHA as well as NCPA. So I'd done my homework. I knew a little bit about him. But the, at the end of the interview, he said, well, this is what we're going to do. I, I really like some of your ideas. I like what you had to say. And uh, I'm going to hire you, but I hadn't planned on hiring a girl. Now, it took me back in a, a, a back a bit, and uh, I'm having all these conversations in my head. What does he mean by that? And what wonder what this is all? What is this? But I knew that positions were tight. I knew he was well connected. I knew that he had a great reputation. So I decided to accept the position. My buddy went on to um, dental school and uh, thought, well, I'll just figure it out and see what he, um, what he meant by this. So very early, uh, within the first couple of weeks, I knew what he meant. He meant, I've been a business owner for 40 years. I have only hired men because that's who was coming to apply for my positions. Um, he didn't mean anything by it. He was excited to work with someone who had ideas about pharmacy and vision about how to care for patients in new and different ways. He talked about uh, if you want to try something, um, if you want to experiment, we're going to try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll move on. And we ended up having such a great relationship and he mentored me along the way. Within six months, I had the opportunity to buy into the pharmacy. And again, in his way, he said, uh, I'm going to make you business partners with my nephew who's um, retiring from the Air Force. He has an MBA, we'll, we'll be great business partners. And the truth of the matter is we were, we didn't choose each other, but I look back to uh, what he said, um, I hadn't planned on hiring a girl, uh, but he didn't mean anything by it. So that's one of my, my uh, pearls to each of you. Make sure that you understand the context and 
see what opportunity is out there. Uh, we went on to uh, change that uh, drugstore into a full service pharmacy, uh, changed the name to Jones Pharmacy, and went on to own three pharmacies and uh, were the first ones to offer immunizations in the community pharmacy. We were the first ones to um, offer strep tests, strep throat testing, and other point of care testing in the pharmacy and under collaborative drug therapy agreements. Um, be able to uh, write the prescription and truly care for the patient. So my message is make sure that you understand what the words mean and uh, look for opportunity. So who else wants to jump in? No, that's, that's, a great, that's a great story because, you know, thinking about the girl, you know, I mean, it's just that really, I think, can resonate with a lot of our listeners if someone was told that, you know that could motivate a lot of people and you really showed what, what a girl can do, right? Uh, but yeah, anyone else who wants to jump in, feel free to, you know, to comment on any of the changing demographics that you've seen. You know, I think one of the interesting things that I've, I've always seen is that, you know, 54% of um, full-time pharmacists are women. But, you know, when you look at some of the CEOs of the large retail chains, they're, they're always male. And um, as you, climb up the ladder and, and I don't know, Kate, if you want to speak to some of the association um, things that you've seen as well, but. Yeah, sure. Topic. Yeah, thanks, Susie. Um, Linda, I didn't know that story about you. That's. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. Um, like I said, I have the opportunity to serve as a state association exec. So Iowa is a small state, um, but we have a very strong state pharmacy association. And so one of my opportunities is to work with leaders in the profession through volunteer roles. Um, and I have the opportunity to work not only with Iowa pharmacists, but pharmacists across the country. And um, a few things that I would share, uh, maybe just thinking back to the changing demographic, um, a little bit about myself and sort of my story into pharmacy and into this role. Um, it wasn't ever something I had set my sights on or in pharmacy school, I wasn't president of any student organizations thinking, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. Um, in fact, when I was a pharmacy student, my 10 year goal was to work part-time. Um, I don't know why, but I thought, well, I'll probably like have kids someday and it seems like I should just work part-time because that's what my mom did, I guess. Um, lo and behold, I work a lot more than part-time. Um, as a state pharmacy association executive. Um, and how I got to this point was really unintentional, but had great mentors along the way that um, through residency and rotations encouraged me to get involved in associations. And I, I followed that advice. And so after pharmacy school, um, did a residency in the state of Iowa and had the opportunity to um, get my foot in the door, I guess, at IPA and then applied for this job when it became available. Um, in my first four years as CEO of the Iowa Pharmacy Association, I had four kids under the age of four. Um, <laughs> Susie is like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. um, I know, I think what the heck too, oh my gosh. But when I was interviewing for this job, I was pregnant with my first. So um, I became a mom and a CEO in the same year. That was 2011. And then went on to have um, our second daughter 16 months later. And then we found out we were pregnant with twins. So that's how we got four in four years. A miraculous feat. Um, I think the biggest feat is that we survived and um, our kids are a little bit older now. They're between the ages of five and nine. Um, but so I get asked a lot about women in the profession and work-life integration, balance, whatever you want to call it. But really where I learn the most is from our pharmacists that are involved in IPA and serve on our board, serve on our committees. I know, Linda, you mentioned you were a past president of WSPA. So the first female president of the Iowa Pharmacy Association was in 1985. And we have had in our total history of 140 years, 11, only 11 out of 140 past presidents have been female. 
Um, but in the last 10 years, over half of those 11, so six out of the 11 female IPA presidents have been in the last 10 years. So there's certainly a shift in terms of association involvement and volunteer leadership that I see from my position in women taking on those roles. And a couple themes that I would share um, are really, you know, just engagement and seeking out the opportunities to be professionally involved. It's sort of like, I didn't get out of the gate of pharmacy school saying, I think I'm gonna be the CEO of a state pharmacy association. And all of my past presidents that I've talked to would say the same thing. They never said, someday I'm gonna be president of my state pharmacy association, but they signed up for a committee, they showed up to a conference, they got asked to speak for a continuing education. And, you know, little by little, um, you know, their appetite increased for what they got out of being involved and the professional um, satisfaction and opportunities that came with that. And then the second piece that I've noticed as a theme, and I always share with students, I think your best career decision that you can make is in choosing your life partner or your spouse. Um, it was my husband that told me to apply for this job when I was like, oh, I'm like seven months pregnant. I can't apply to be the CEO of a state pharmacy association. And my husband was like, well, you can, and why wouldn't you? Um, but even in the women and um, male pharmacists that I work with through association work, um, I talk about this a lot just because, like I said, people always tend to talk to me about the juggling act of young families and raising a family and having a professional career. Um, that support at home is so important in seeking out leadership positions that you um, have a partner that supports your passions and understands why maybe after work you're still working or maybe why you would give up an evening or a weekend instead of being with friends, your pharmacy colleagues are another group of friends. Um, so that support for at home is really an important theme that I've seen in women that take on leadership positions, both in their um, day job, so to speak, but also in the professional leadership opportunities that come through volunteering in professional associations. So that's the vantage point I've had. Um, the last piece I would share, so six out of the last 10 years have been female. And we just turned over our officer positions. Actually, last week we had the IPA annual meeting. Um, but for the first time ever in our 140 year history, we had three consecutive female presidents. So at, all at one time, the president elect, president and chairman of the board, it's a three year term, were three consecutive women. So that was a pretty um, wonderful milestone to hit, and those three women um, were very proud to be part of that of part of that group. So hopefully not the last, but it was the first. Yeah, you know, that was great. And knowing your um, legacy at how strong Iowa is, I know that all of those men were really proud to see that too. I'm just thinking of Tom Temple and Matt Osterhaus and and Bobo. I they're really proud to see that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Brooke or Alex, did you want to add anything to this, this in terms of the demographic change that you've seen? I think this is a great discussion so far. I think if we want to see more women in leadership positions as CEOs, as deans in management roles, I think we know from experience that we need to see leaders who we can relate to and who look like us. And what I mean by that is when, when I was uh, first a pharmacist and looking for a mentor and looking for those career advancement roles, all the females who I saw in those roles work nights, work weekends, constantly stressed, constantly busy, and that wasn't the type of professional life I was looking for. And it wasn't certainly the work-life integration that was quote unquote promised when uh, females enter the field of pharmacy. So I think if we want more women in leadership positions, then women in leadership positions like ourselves 
need to think about what externally are we projecting in terms of our busyness badge that we like to wear and how stressed we are at certain times. If we can make our current positions more relatable, then I'll, I think we'll see more women come up the ranks. Very true. That's very true. Because when I think of the mentors that I had, they were always, you know, women that I saw being able to still make it to their children's games and activities and, you know, bal balancing things out. So um, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I just wanted to build really on something that Kate said. So I also took my probably at this point, my most important leap in my career when I was seven months pregnant and applied for a director role. But what led me to apply for that director role is something I would highly recommend to, to everybody, male or female, but making sure that you have mentors of the opposite sex or even just from a different perspective and background. Because Paul Zagami um, at the time was my regional vice president and he called me and said, hey, there's this regional healthcare director role that's open. You should really consider applying it, applying for it. And I said, Paul, I'm seven months pregnant. You know, uh, I don't know that anybody would want me to apply for this job right now. And he said to me, he said, Alex, if the roles were reversed and if it, if it was your husband and you were seven months pregnant, would you encourage him to apply for the job? And if you guys get it, you'll, you'll figure it out. And I said, well, yeah, of course. And so he said to me, so how is this different? You know, just because you're pregnant and about to embark on a, a change in life personally doesn't mean that you can't figure it out professionally. And so that was really what gave me the motivation to, to apply. And subsequently I got the role. And I think it's really important to point out that um, I had terrific female mentors in my life, but they gave me very different advice. Um, the advice I got from my female mentors was, you know, other opportunities will come along and you're going you're gonna to have enough on your plate. Like you don't need to add this to the plate. Um, so having that different perspective was really important. And my career has moved in a, in a direction that I'm really proud of. And I feel is very fulfilling because I took that leap and took that risk. So making sure you have that diversity of perspective and experience within your mentorship circle and then um, to build on what Brooke was saying, I consider it a, a challenge to myself personally to share in my day-to-day -day environment with everybody that I work with, this is what it looks like to be a working mother. And that's okay, because if you are projecting this aura of everything is perfect, everything is fine, you're not relatable. And that is what I feel like is leading to the gaps in women moving up in leadership. We have a lot of really talented women that think that they can't do the job because of X, Y, and Z. And the reality is you can do anything you want to um, and you just have to figure it out like we all do. Nothing is ever perfect and we all have to integrate work and life. And sometimes the balance is completely skewed, but we figure it out uh, together and we get through it. So really important points by both of them. Yeah, definitely. I love that last part because I think it's so true that nothing is is perfect. And I, I can speak to that just even on my social media that um, I had posted a, a in within the pharmacist moms group, my like I moved my kids car seats, like their booster seats and underneath it was just like there was dry cereal and there was like old milk in the back. And like I am the first to admit, like when I drop off my kids in the car, I'm the mom who has food coming out, like as they're getting out, like the food is like coming out of the car too. And I have a new car, it just doesn't matter, it didn't help. So I think understanding that not everything is going to be perfect and I'm okay with having a messy car because I'm, you know, I'm focused on work or do, doing other things as well and, and I'll get to it. So I think, um, you know, I definitely believe that you have to, you have to show all the sides that it, it's not perfect. Um, and I'd like to, you know, shift gears and talk a little bit about students or even um, pharmacists who are looking for career changes. I get a lot of messages, you know, from pharmacists all the time saying, you know what, I'm not happy where I'm at right now and I'm looking for something different. Um, do you have any ideas or from pharmacy students, you know, who are looking for mentors or well, just ways to navigate the pharmacy profession, you know, as a preceptor, I see that a lot with my pharmacy students. Um, you know, they come in thinking they want to go into one field and then they leave the rotation, you know, with a different idea. What are some, you know, resources or 
you know, that you would provide to young women in pharmacy now who are graduating or to any woman in pharmacy who's looking um, to either pivot or, or do something different? And Brooke, I think you were going to start this one off. Sure. This really shifted for me about two years ago when I was working with a group of high achieving fourth year students just about to graduate. These were the students who were going to go on to do residency. We were talking about mid-year prep and everything and we decided to do a book club together and the book I chose was They Don't Teach Corporate in College by Alexandra Levitt. It's not a pharmacy book but it's a wonderful textbook, uh, textbook so to speak. It's kind of a how-to guide. And we went through some of the chapters together and I was astonished at how unprepared these high performing graduates were for life after graduation. Navigating certain topics like networking, uh, navigating their own self-doubt, self how to have difficult conversations. Uh, and I think students right now are getting the picture that there's not a huge demand, especially in metropolitan areas for pharmacy jobs. The community fields that they love aren't necessarily the most positive working environments. They're getting the message that they have to look for non-traditional roles, but they don't always have the right questions to ask when they have their assigned mentor meetings at school, for example. So any one of us who's working with pharmacy students or trainees, realizing that they may not have the right questions to ask to get the type of feedback they need from you. So as a mentor or a coach for these students, we need to be the ones kind of driving the conversation, uh, priming them with questions about, have you really thought about what your skills are? And is this role that you're applying for really aligned with what you can bring to the table? And if you think about yourself five to 10 years from now, does it offer the type of advancement and the work-life integration that you're looking for? And really trying to probe them a little bit with some of these longer range questions, because for some students, all they can see is the next test and then the NAPLEX and then graduation, and then just getting that first job. is And so it's encouraging them to think a little bit longer range uh, would be my suggestion for anyone who's precepting or working at a college of pharmacy or has any trainees that they're working with. That's great. You you know, I, would just, I, I would like to jump in here as well. I agree with everything that you said, Brooke. So to our students, find your faculty or your mentor that you've been assigned. Your mentor isn't going to be um, knowledgeable about, about everything that you might need help with or assistance with, but find, um, but your mentor or your faculty member is going to be able to help you with your network. If, if I don't know um, the answer to whatever it is we're talking about, I can certainly find the right person whether that person is in Washington, D.C. or University of Illinois or um, out in the corporate world, we can get you connected. And the network is going to be so important. I think about some of our folks that have gotten connected in the field of informatics because um, you're, we might be light on that in the curriculum, but I can provide you with someone who's built a career on this and that leads to residency and that leads to a dream job. So um, rely on your people who are going to be already networked because we can find the right people for you to talk to. I'll build off that, Linda. Um, I, I, I think it's scary for some pharmacy students right now looking at the job market. Um, and also, like Susie said, you know, there are pharmacists out there who aren't satisfied today. And, you know, we can't turn a blind eye to the realities that are in practice um, that make it not a dream job for some people. But there are also pharmacists that have their dream jobs. You use that term. And one thing I would say is I, I know several pharmacists who love being a pharmacist and feel like they are in their dream job. And all of those pharmacists I know would tell me, and I've heard them tell me, they got their dream job through people that they met at a meeting outside of their job. No one got their dream job surfing a job board, internet job board sitting on their couch. Um, and so I think 2020 being in a pandemic kind of throws a new twist into everything that we're talking about. I mean, I think about all 
my beliefs on work-life integration, all my beliefs on networking, all of the things that, um, you know, I've built up in 15 years of being a pharmacist um, to form my opinions have been somewhat turned upside down by the pandemic. And so what does networking look like today for pharmacy students? Um, but I would say the opportunities are still out there. Just like pre-pandemic, you have to seek things out um, and you have to seek out what maybe in your state or in your you know, county or locally, or also what's in your area of interest, which for a student is probably still wide open. You know, they haven't honed in on something like specialty or informatics for the, for the most part or ownership. Um, but really, you know, trying to find a path or at least getting started. And I would say, um, I don't know anyone who's a strong leader in pharmacy that isn't willing to take time out to you know, spend 15, 20 minutes talking to a student. And it's encouraging students to make that bold ask and say, you know, I just got a, an email last week from a student in another state that was asked to interview a leader in pharmacy. And I was like, well, how'd you get my name? I would love to talk to you. And so, you know, most leaders um, are gonna say yes. And we have a very small profession um, but it takes a mentor encouraging a student to even know to ask those questions or how to seek out in a virtual world um, opportunities and, you know, what does mid-year look like in 2020 and how do you take advantage of those opportunities is very different than um, when I was a student. But definitely the importance of building a professional network cannot be understated. Um, I jumped on this call with Susie this morning and the other panelists, and I was like, wow, this is so neat. I have met all of these women before through other various professional meetings that I've attended. Um, and it's just a, a blessing that we all get to be together, but I think underscores the people you meet that you may call upon for a job in the future or just for support or advice um are going to be people that you meet attending meetings and going to other professional events i just want to piggyback on something that kate said about leveraging the fact that you're a student right now and that's so powerful when you put that in an email or a, a private message to somebody people in leadership positions are willing to give back and especially something so valuable as their time they're willing to give that back to students. So if you leverage the fact that you're a student right now and you have the opportunity to reach out to almost anybody in the pharmacy profession, they'll, they're willing to talk to you. Something changes when you graduate and then all of a sudden you seem to be like this eager job seeker. <laughs> it's not, I'm not saying it's not possible. You should also still be reaching out to people and networking. But the fact that you can say you're a student or a trainee somewhere just adds another layer to it. And I think another skill that's lacking right now is just the ability to self-advocate for yourself. I remember I was working with a student who was a very strong student and she was interviewing for a job in another state and she was talking to me about, about how nervous she was and she just didn't think she was gonna land this role. And I said, well, let's, let's role play a little bit. I pretend I'm the hiring manager. Tell me why I should, should consider you for this position. And she talked a little bit about her leadership role at the school and a little bit about her grades and how she worked here and worked there, but never once did she mention her military background. And I think students don't always know how to pitch themselves and to talk about all of their strengths and kind of tie it up with a bow so that it comes out in the most articulate fashion. And I think that's something that Colleges of Pharmacy and like my own employer, that's something we can work on and something we can help students with. Yeah, for sure. Those are really great points. I just wanted to speak to not just students, but existing pharmacists today, because I think all of us, and I can only speak for myself, but in talking to my other friends that are pharmacists and they're practicing on the bench today, we all feel the pressure of the immense amount of change that's undergoing, our profession is currently un undergoing in one way or another. Um, and it's really impacting our day-to-day -day happiness, but uh, for lack of a better way to say, it, you kind of have to Marie Kondo your professional life too, you know, and look at what brings you joy and then to Brooke's point, go out and find ways to get more experience and skills in those areas that bring you joy. I certainly, when I graduated pharmacy school, 
Um, I definitely did not see myself in corporate America, nor did I see myself doing clinical product design. I wanted to bring Amcare to a large retail chain. Um, and I get to do that today in a weird way through my work, but I certainly didn't see myself here. And what got me here is because I wasn't satisfied just with practicing in a community environment. I had a desire to show and demonstrate that I could do something more. And so I became the HIV lead for my market. And that was my first step really on the career path that I had today um, is getting those experiences of implementing new products and services to improve health outcomes for people with HIV. Um, and that was a long time ago. And it was basically because I said, I need something else because I'm not getting 100% of the satisfaction I want from my professional life. So just ask, figure out what it is that will bring you joy and then ask for an opportunity to, to find that joy in your life. And Alex, I so agree with you. When you go the extra step and uh, work on the next project or the next visionary thing that's going to care for patients, in a really unique way. That's how, as a young pharmacist, you build your confidence as well. You try something, you do well, you do the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Oh, maybe this one didn't work, but you know what? This is one of the things that I always tell my, my young faculty members. Well, just brush it off, brush it off your shoulders. It's okay, don't carry it around. You had an experiment, this one didn't work, go on to the next great thing. How you build your confidence and become interested to other people, other employers as you move up the move up the career ladder. Great point. So I think that these have all been great points. You know, talking about ways in which um, progress has been made for women. You know, and the ways in which women can um, help to progress. Um, you know, especially in areas that maybe they were predominantly male, like when Kate was speaking to how many presidents were, were predominantly male and you know now all this progress has been made. Um, there are some gaps that could remain. But going on to like culture, and I went to a talk, this was pre-pandemic, but it was just about women in general and they were talking about culture at, in various work environments and even um, you know, um, when company culture and, and looking at performance evaluations, for example, and why is it that, you know, women are predominantly the ones who plan the birthday parties, who plan the baby showers, who are planning all the events at work, but that's not part of their performance evaluation. So they're, they're helping to change and bring everyone together at the workplace, but nobody's really giving credit per se for that. And, um, and so a lot of um, some of the Fortune 500 companies that were there, um, we're talking about adding that in to, um, you know, to help with performance evaluations. Um, you know, have you guys seen any culture changes at in your workplaces or, or things that have changed or, you know, recently or, um, you know, that you've seen regarding culture change or institutional culture, you know? Brooke or Kate, I think one of you is going to, yeah. Yeah, I can start this one off. Uh, we know that wellness has been a hot topic in pharmacy for quite some time, but it really has been getting the spotlight in the past couple of years as we've seen some of the national association meetings have had a lot of guest speakers and topics regarding wellness in all aspects of pharmacy. I'm really proud of the efforts that Midwestern has taken in the wellness space. Uh, about two years ago, our dean instituted a wellness committee, one focused on faculty and one focused on students, and that, now that has merged into one committee. And we've really taken an intentional approach to finding out what faculty and students want in terms of wellness, what's going to make sense for our community, realizing that may be different than what was presented at the national meeting or what may work for a different pharmacy space. And then planning these events. And I think to your point, for the person who plans the parties and the socials, you can call yourself a chair of the wellness committee. You can create a wellness committee at your own institution if you feel like that type of workload is always falling on a certain number of people. Uh, so that is something that we've just been really intentional with. We're surveying faculty baseline and then every so often we're trying to have more frequent touch points with them and have more intentional professional development sessions that focus on work life integration and focus on networking and focus on social media for faculty. Things that are kind of in our periphery that we're always thinking about, but they don't get as much of the spotlight as therapeutic topics or guest speakers that come in to speak about something else. 
So that's something that I've seen in our workspace. And I feel like although we have the pressures and the burnout that other colleges of pharmacy and other sectors of pharmacy feel, I feel like we have that collegiality and at least a safe place to call home and talk about some of these issues. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. Um, that's great. I can speak a little bit just as an association what our culture is because we don't aren't really a pharmacist employer. We have a couple of pharmacists that work at IPA, but not where most pharmacists work. But from an association standpoint, you know, I think about this topic and about what we ask from pharmacists to be engaged and be leaders and, and give back to help further the mission of an association. It's often volunteer time. You know, sometimes it's in the evenings weekends, you know, time away from work, time away from families. So whether male or female pharmacists that are volunteer leaders in the profession um, are taking time away from those other pieces of their life. Um, I have seen a shift in sort of that work-life integration piece, both from male and female pharmacists that are involved in associations. And that's sort of, you know, blending together um, personal and business travel. If you're able to attend an association event, we have members. I love it. Actually, um, this year our meeting was all virtual, but the year before, um, a couple of our award recipients brought their whole family. Like how amazing for, you know, a seven-year-old um, daughter to see her mom get an award. Like, I think that's awesome. Um, and so if you can find a way to make that happen. Now, I would say this has come almost full circle because our president, who was just installed last week as IPA, she showed pictures of taking her daughter, who's now in pharmacy school, to state association meetings. And Linda, maybe when you were president, Washington State did this. I mean, they used to be like family affairs, like family vacations. And society has just changed. You know, I don't think that exists the way it, it used to. Um, but there is sort of a pendulum swing back to some of that integration that we talked about. And I think it's, again, it's not just a female conversation because I think there are dads that want to be even, you know, part of their children's life and uh, coaching soccer and being at events and, and really just, again, trying to integrate it together is a piece of our culture um, that we try to focus on. And the other cultural piece, this doesn't necessarily fit into the changing demographic conversation, but more around building a network, is we very intentionally have a diverse membership of pharmacists in all practice settings. And I think the importance of our leadership conversations around our board when it's not just hospital pharmacists or just AMCARE or just um, community-based or independent owners, but really the learning that happens from the different perspectives that get brought and that diversity um, helps round out, you know, really what pharmacists can bring to the table back at their own practices or um, by learning from other areas of practice too. So sort of just that well-rounded network um, can lead to professional satisfaction and that wellness, you know, down the road where you might not even think about it right today. From a cultural perspective, a lot of those, those values, I'm fortunate to say is something that we've valued at Walgreens for a while because historically we've been like a very family oriented um, company. We, a lot of people at Walgreens talk about my Walgreens family. I certainly have my own Walgreens family from when I was just a young pharmacist. But um, I think the thing that I took away, Suzanne, as you were speaking, is those are not um, those are not about just planning events. To me, that's a leadership characteristic, right? Like you are planning those events because you care about your people and their happiness and their engagement level. And so that's what I would just challenge: is that I'm sure that there's anything. Um, many things that people are doing today that if they really thought about what is the desired outcome of doing this, is it just to send people birthday cards or is the desired outcome you're sending this birthday card because you care and value that person and their contribution to the organization and you want to make sure that they stay connected and engaged, that's a leadership skill. And that I imagine would be in the competencies and something that would be valued and part of a performance review. But I think oftentimes, particularly with women, 
I've seen it my, in my own personal development as well as those of my team, we oftentimes um, minimize everything that we bring to the table um, because we're so used to caring and supporting others. And in fact, we should be maximizing the value of those attributes because that's the type of leadership that our profession and that the world right now needs is that caring, emotive, and collaborative style of leadership that many female leaders do bring to the table today. So we're very fortunate with that regard. Um, I just wanted to add uh, two, two points. Integration, it's really important. And yes, Kate, we saw, Grant and I did that successfully with our girls. In fact, they um, got hauled around to so many pharmacy meetings that they just came to expect that we would always be staying in a nice hotel. Uh, so number two is Association of Women in Science. And I don't know if any of you are active in that particular organization, but it's become quite active on our um, health sciences campus at WSU and I serve as a as an advisor and so it's PhD students as well as PharmD med students nursing students and um, it has been a great experience of getting all of these professions to uh, work together to come to meetings together and then participate in programming that is all around mentoring and networking and and some of the, the soft skills that I saw, or that I heard some of you talking about that are so important as we move forward with our careers. And um, I've seen everything from time management to uh, take some of the, the personality um, uh, 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 tests as well uh, to identify strengths and weaknesses. But I want to tell you a little bit of, of, of a story about our person who was the uh, president of the AWIS um, Association, and by the way, it accepts men into the membership as well. So we have some men on campus uh, participating in, in some of this great programming. So our president honed her skills uh, while getting a PhD. So she's great in the lab doing all this, um, but as, she, as um, her commitment with the association continued and she played a huge role in really getting it off the ground and getting it to be valuable. Those leadership skills transferred as she was seeking her seeking employment after uh, getting her, her PhD. So uh, she has now joined Merck in New Jersey. Um, there were a couple of references that they called at Washington State University. One is the director of her lab, uh, her, her PhD mentor, but um, they wanted to talk with me as well. So way different skills from her PhD mentor. They wanted to talk with me about her ability to communicate and how she had demonstrated leadership skills. And I could talk very clearly and authentically about what she had done with this organization. And that's what they wanted. They wanted someone who could translate this uh, work that they're doing at Merck to other vendors um, in a way that the science would be understood. And it was right up her alley. But uh, being involved in uh, that kind of an association uh, can pay dividends as well. And it's just another example of how culture has changed. I just want to jump in really quickly. I support everything that Linda is saying, and I just want to echo something that Alex mentioned about culture shift. And I think sometimes we wait for these corporations or these organizations we work for. We think big culture change is so this big sweeping movement that has to occur, but really culture change begins with us individually. And if we feel like there's a change that needs to happen, what steps can we take to start those changes today with just even our smaller circles around us? And what kind of leader do we wish we had? And how can we exude those, those characteristics today? How can I mentor others the way that I wish I am being mentored, that I was mentored? And I think recognizing that you can leave from where you are. You don't necessarily need the title or position or wait for a big new strategic plan or a big culture change or a new mission statement. We can start where we are. And eventually when more and more females get to the top and that culture starts from within, then we will start to see some more larger changes. But 
I think for now we can start within. So I really liked what Alex was saying there about it's a leadership skill. Definitely. I, I agree with that. I think that that's how it all is going to start. It's just one, one small change or one little person. And then, you know, you, you see this, this movement and, and different, you can really make an impact and, and it happens. Um, as the founder of Pharmacist Moms, I get a lot of messages um, pretty much daily from women that are asking questions about balancing and, you know, balancing their profession that they still, you know, they love their job or they have a dream job, but then maybe they find out they're pregnant or they are pregnant and should they go on the interview? And, um, you know, hearing stories today, though, I think they now have the answer that they, they probably should still go on that interview. But, um, you know, what are some tips that maybe you have for some of these women who are trying to balance responsibilities at home and at work, um, you know, final words, final thoughts for, for women who are listening um, to this? Sure, sure. I could give a um, couple final thoughts, I guess. And I know, in fact, when I reached out to Susie, I think it was shortly after uh, you started Pharmacist Moms, and I was just so impressed with the story about how you took it on and have now created this tremendous network of women that have a place to not only talk about pharmacy, but talk about some of those very unique um, parenting and professional challenges. Um, so kudos to you and thanks for what you've done to get us to this point and having this panel today. Um, you know, one thing, and actually um, I've said this before and it made me think of Alex, sort of your and my stories, um, is there's never a perfect time. There are only opportune times. Um, so when an opportunity comes and, you know, I think it sort of has to be factored into what's happening in totality in your life, but, you know, there'll never be a perfect time to apply for a new job, to train for a marathon, to, you know, you can't time having a baby or, you know, just anything you can fill in the blank, you know, there'll never be a perfect time. So don't wait for perfect. Um, you know, look for opportunities. Um, I talked about the importance of networking, but also even more importantly, um, you know, what does that support look like from your closest circle um, at home and, and around you? And then, you know, I think just embracing the strengths that you have as a female pharmacist, female leader, um, we sometimes minimize, you know, the strengths that we have because they may not be what we witnessed other leaders have, you know, whether it's, for me, I would share the story. It was the fact that I cry and I, I sometimes cry when I wish I wouldn't cry. And I actually sought out professional coaching because I thought this was just such a horrible trait that like, oh my gosh, why, why do I cry? <laughs> um, and in fact, when I reflected on these times that had happened and what came of it, you know, it's not like I cry every day, um, but that actually, you know, it's being authentic and sometimes being vulnerable. And those words, you know, might sound cliche, but we shouldn't run away from who we are. And in fact, um, it can help us in our positions by embracing that. Um, so the authenticity of, of your own leadership characteristics. For me, it's being an emotional leader and being real. And whether that's, you know, embracing the chaos that is my life at home with four kids and it's messy. And um, I'm actually surprised no one's barged in this room right now on a two hour Zoom where I happen to be working from home today. Um, but just sort of embracing it, you know, embrace where you're at because there'll be times where um, home has to come first. And then there'll be times where you're really gonna power through leadership opportunities and um, goals and initiatives at work, but just embrace where you're at and embrace the traits that make you, you. And I think by owning that, you'll find the most professional and personal success and happiness. Oh, that's great, that's great. Um, who would like to go go next? You know, I'll I'll um, hop on. Couldn't agree with everything that you said, Kate. Couldn't agree with everything more. And 
in addition to everything that I've talked about with regard to develop your network, use your network. Um, when when I hear University of Illinois, I think Jan Engel and now Jan leads us with ACPE. I think of so many women who are on this great trajectory. Um, so seek out those individuals, make sure that you're, you get someone to give you a, um, an introduction, whether it's virtual or um, a, a, a quick email, but seek the individuals who are going to make you better and who can help shape your vision for where you wanna go. Um, you read some of Gladwell's stuff and you know that uh, people didn't become excellent at something by saying, well, maybe I'll try this or maybe I'll, I'll think about doing this. Commit and uh, keep after whatever your goal is, keep after whatever your vision is. And finally, on top of what Kate has said, don't be afraid. You know, we, we're, we, don't, ha we don't have to be timid. We can, I heard you say we can embrace, we can embrace everything that we've got and we can move forward. And so I would just like to add, uh, to end with, I want you not to be afraid and I want you to lead with courage. I'm gonna go ahead and jump in because that was a great segue to what I was gonna say. Um, two things, one is that your decisions in life are not binary. You know, oftentimes it feels that way that there's a right choice and a wrong choice. But the reality is, is that there's always like a middle or an in between and you just have to make the decision that fits best for you in that moment. Um, but try and make a decision that feels right, um, even if it's scary and leading with courage. You know, one of the key things I, I tell to people that I mentor that are female and looking to make the next step in their career is that there's a statistic that says that men will apply for a role even if they only meet 50% of the qualifications and women will only apply for a role if they meet 100%. So don't wait until you're 100% ready to do anything. Um, make the choice that feels right for you in the moment but it's often a good indication if you want to do something and it's a little bit scary that you should do it um, and make that decision. And the worst thing that will happen is it doesn't work out and you get a different decision. Um, but choices are not binary. And just because you make one decision today doesn't mean that everything's going to go down this one path for the rest of your life. You get to make another decision tomorrow. So great point, Sayal. I love all of this advice. I'll just add some of my final thoughts that I think we need to get our asks out of our head and ask for what we feel we need. And it might just be the smallest shifts that give us the biggest impact. I remember when our kids were little, my husband and I would talk every Friday night, okay, who's working out on Saturday morning and who's got Sunday morning? We had to make a plan for it. You can't just sit around and wait and magically two hours are gonna show up for you to go work out. And we would also trade who's gonna have three hours at Starbucks to go do work, who's gonna take Saturday afternoon, who's gonna take Sunday afternoon, examples like that. And even just knowing that I had those two hours waiting helped lessen the anxiety of the workload that I felt was piling up because I knew there was a solution waiting for me. And those are very small asks. So we can't uh, imagine that people can think about what's going on in our heads. We have to get those ideas out and we have to ask for what we need. Thank you. Thank you all for participating today and for all of your wonderful thoughts on this topic. I think that everyone listening will, you know, probably has been taking notes and um, on all of these great, great points and great tips for advice. If anyone has any questions, you know, you could feel free to reach out to any of us here today. Um, I, I know that we would all be more than willing to help. Um, but thank you all again. Thank you to Cardinal for sponsoring this panel today. And I hope everyone has an amazing Women um, Woman Pharmacist Day 2020. Thank you.